Thank you all for coming today uh, for the finissage of the detail um, video art from the Pearl River Delta. Um, so, um, I'm Selina Basra, Curatorial Assistant at the Times Art Center in Berlin. And as I only just joined the team, uh, it was particularly interesting for me to witness these past month and see the scope and depth of the video art from uh, the Pearl River Delta. But still, um, this first month working here left me really wanting to delve further into the topic, which is also one of the reasons I'm very much looking forward to the coming talk uh, with Nikita Chai and Melanie Romiguer, um, who found the time in their own very busy, engaging program to come here tonight. And we are very happy they, they found the time. Um, the detail is curated by Huan Ru, who can't be here today, but Shi Bei is sitting there. Uh, and also, one of the artists is present tonight, I heard, from the second episode, um, Wang Xiaoping. So, particular thanks to him as well for being here. Um, just to give a brief introduction um, for our two panelists tonight, um, Nikita Chai is currently chief curator at the Guangdong Times Museum. Um, and her recent curatorial research and practice have focused on alternative modernities and trajectories between China and the Global South. She has curated exhibitions such as the a Museum That Is Not in 2011, Big Tail Elephants, One Hour, No Room, Five Shows in 2016, and most recently, a solo exhibition with Omar Fast and Chao Chao. She also organizes a para-curatorial series at Guangdong Times Museum. And uh, among the topics most recently were South of the South, Rhetorics of Geography, and Imageries of Delinking. She also participated in the curatorial program of the Apple in 2009 and 2010. Melanie Romiguier just took over the position of Head of Visual Arts at DAAD, Artists in Berlin program, in late 2018. Um, at the gallery, she recently curated exhibitions with Rosella Biscotti and also Minerva Cueva is currently on view, No Room to Play. And just as a side note, there's also a talk um, at the gallery tomorrow with her and Minerva at 7 p.m. Um, she um, is now currently preparing with Anna Katharina Gebers an exhibition uh, entitled Deep Sounding, History as Multiple Narratives, which will be presented in summer 2019. And previously she worked as curator and exhibition director at Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. And there she curated exhibitions amongst others um, with Mariana, Mariana Castillo de Bal and um, also Michael Beutler. And before that, she worked as curatorial assistant at Documenta, and she studied cultural sciences and aesthetic practice in Hildesheim. So in this talk, they will both situate their practices by looking at um, different strategies of storytelling and active withdrawal in artistic practices, um, which is important for curatorial practices at both in Berlin and Guangdong. And they will take a closer look at different forms of resistance, shaping and disrupting institutional practices. So I had a sneak peek at the presentations, and I'm very much looking forward to both of them. Nikita will begin, so welcome you both to stage. Thank you very much. So the title of my presentation tonight is actually clearly inspired by Ursula K. Le Guin's The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. Le Guin's story ends with the image of people walking away from the injustice social system of Omelas believes the hope of finding a different utopia in suspense. But I'm not going to search for Le Guin's utopia today. Instead, I'm going to tell the myth of the pitch colony, which was a fable written by Tao Yuanming in the fifth century about a chance encounter with a utopia where the people live an ideal existence in harmony with nature, unaware of the outside world for centuries. Tao Yuanming was a poet lived in the Sixth Dynasty period, which was a period of instability and turmoil. Unlike other Chinese literati of his time, Tao decided to withdraw from civil service and spent most of his time in reclusion, living in a small house in the countryside. Indulged in the spirit of political retreat, Tao wrote the story of a fisherman discover a grotto at the end of a river in the forest. And the story reads, 
After a dozen steps, it opened into a flood of light. He saw before his eyes a wide, level valley with houses and fields and farms. There are bamboos and mulberries. Farmers were working, and dogs and chickens were running about. The dresses of the men and women were like those of the outside world, and the old men and children appeared very happy and contented. They were greatly astonished to see the fisherman and asked him where he had come from. The fisherman told them and was invited to their homes, where wine was served and chicken was killed for dinner to entertain him. The villagers, hearing of his coming, all came to see him and to talk. They said that their ancestors had come here as refugees to escape from the tyranny of Qin Shi Huang, who is the builder of Great Wall, some 600 years ago, and they had never left it. They were thus completely cut out from the wall and asked, "What was the ruling dynasty now?" I would like to. So after the fishermen returned to the outside wall and tried to relocate the village with a local authority, the God of Heaven is nowhere to be found. Yet this fisherman of Taoyuanming reminds me of Zhou Tao, whose short film *South Stone* was shown in the second episode of the detail recently in Times Art Center Berlin. Zhou Tao talks about the fisherman appear in the Woodley Cave uh, in this uh, video clips. As pioneers of the conflictual landscapes, who cohabit with the industrial residues and take agencies in creating their own recreational activities at the end of the world, Zhou Tao often compares its aesthetic of cinematography with the aesthetics of Liu Bai, which means "living blank" in Yuan Dynasty literary painting. While he is fully aware that the literary spiritual conception of escapism. Has lost its currency. He believes that human agency can be exercised by preserving the internal poetic space. The fishermen and landscapes are mutually constitutive, and the relation between human and nature is not a dualistic one, a subject and object. Nature has been a key concept in Chinese philosophy. Especially the nature celebrated in mountain and water paintings in Yuan Dynasty, these landscapes are already abstract inventions, bearing the literary subjective construction informed by the cultural political milieu. Such idyllic critique of urbanization and commodification can also be found in contemporary artists' representation of landscape as landscape without nature. Where they intend to undo the binary between nature and culture with mediation of allegories and imagery, this is an image of 2008, shot from the angle of a tenant farmer's family living on the fields across Times Times Museum. I think we have、uh, shown this image at the opening talk by Han Ru. I'm. <laughs> This is a later image from 2011. It is a work by artist Rosanna Perez Mendes, and it was displayed in the East Wing Gallery of Times Museum. It is also my favorite image. The Spanish sentence projected upon the rapidly changing city landscape of Guangzhou perfectly illustrates institutional geographies and temporalities of Times Museum. In the exhibition catalog of、uh, cities on the move,、uh, which was curated by Ho Han Ru and Hans Urit Albers in 1997, they expanded the studies of the Po River Delta brought forward by Ram Kuhas in Great Leap Forward, and claimed that such spectacle transformations are also a process of renegotiation re between the established social structure and influences of foreign, especially Western. Models of social structure, values, and ways of living. 
They compare the hybridity, speed, and dystopia aspect of Asian modernization with Western model and emphasize that these forming global cities unavoidably led to contradictions, contestations, chaos, and even violence. It's a process of collective consciousness or desire to reestablish Asia's strong position in the modern world through competing with other, especially Western contexts. Confrontations and conflicts between the two camps became the driving force of Asian urban cultural life. This is a recent piece of Kanxuan titled This is a Slum, showcased in a duo solo in Times Museum recently, end of 2018. Kanxuan works on and off on commercials besides her career as an artist and she shot a series of urban landscape for a company to promote the city of Guangzhou in 2013. The footage was rejected by the client because they thought Guangzhou looked too much like a slum in this gray, homogenous representation, the, the screen uh, down there. The real Guangzhou is behind. Um, and why we can easily tell there are two different subjective conceptions about the same landscape, and the definition lies in multiple modes of understanding, which are often conflictual. So are there really two camps? Can we walk away from the obsession of competition and dichotomy? And this is where we are, situating in a diorama and witnessing the constant transformation of the city from the commanding height of the media in my environment, which is part of the wall, and a wall from a grain of sand. So how do we build a common ground in confronting the speed and scale of acceleration and deceleration? How do we critically document the transient moments, which are at the same time local, translocal, and multi-local? I suppose we will need maps, maps of the past to revisit the history of Po River Delta and Canton, and maps that don't exist yet to navigate the future. This is a map of the earliest stage of globalization, dated back to the period of, period of uh, colonial trade, and, um, and that in this map, you can already see that uh, Canton is actually on the top, very tiny there. And this is another map at the peak of the silver trade in the 17th century. And, and Canton was actually the only treated port at that time, opened by the Qing dynasty. And, and also Canton was the only place that uh, foreigners can live and work. So informed by such histories of, uh, sorry, my, <laughs> my, oh. I have another map, a chart of the Po River Delta of Canton. And actually from this map, you can see um, how from the Southern Sea, you can enter Canton. And Canton was also uh, the battlefield of the two opium wars. I can continue telling you about stories of these um, maps and also a lot of lost and invented identities across borders, such as the large number of Cantonese uh, coolies after the two uh, opium war, and um, you can read from the image between um, 250,000 and 400,000 coolies left Chinese soil by ships willingly or unwillingly under a contract system to work in other countries in the 19th century. And a lot of them actually ended up in the uh, Caribbean and also the west coast of the United States as gold mine workers, uh, railway workers. Um, this is also one of these um, 
um, invented or lost identities is uh, a female pirate in the 18th century, uh, Zheng Yi Sao, who you can see her representation in the online game Civilization VI, and also in the recent Hollywood production Pirates of the Caribbean. She was uh, originally from Canton, as what we call Tanka, Tanka, Tanka women. Tanka women actually means people that live on the boats. So this is a portrait of Tanka boat women um, drawn by a Cantonese artisan called Lam Kwa. I'm still trying to figure out why they were called Kwa all the time by the British uh, colonizers because uh, in Cantonese, I couldn't find a um, responding name. They actually have name. Um, they all have their Chinese name, but in the museum, usually they have uh, Kwa as the ending of the name. I can continue telling you about stories of this lost and invented identities across borders, such as, again, larger number of Cantonese men and women swam across the bays of Shenzhen to reach Hong Kong between 1960 and 1980. And more than 100,000 Vietnamese boat people took refuge in Hong Kong during and after the Vietnam War. There is also the more recent migration of African grassroots trader from Hong Kong and then to Guangzhou since the end of 1990s, which formed the biggest African community in Asia. This is one commission of Mahi Wok Nye, funded and supported by Times Museum and developed from the research uh, residency all the way south, initiated in 2018. We just finished shooting the film earlier this year with the working title of Nashin. Um, these scenes were mainly shot in the wholesale markets of Guangzhou, where Chinese migrant workers provide various trade-related services to African traders. Despite the language barriers and cultural differences, the two groups have built a mutually beneficial economic relationship. They share a similar structural marginalization in urban China, China due to their non-huko or non-citizenship status and their categorization as the floating population by the Chinese state. In a global context, of the declining influence of the West, the artist intends to investigate the personal trajectories, individual life paths, career choices, and common strategies and agencies in the Guangzhou African community at a local scale. The film has been selected by the upcoming Singapore Biennial, open in November 2019, and it will be shown in a group exhibition in Times Museum End of the Year. We also hope that next year, the film can be screened here in Berlin. So informed by such, such histories of withdrawal and retreat from the North, Times Museum launched a series of programs about the subaltern history and the transnational resonance between southern China and the south of the world, which have been overshadowed by the capital and material flow championed by the urbanization process and export-oriented economic growth over the past 30 years. As a result of China's open market policy, uh, marked by Deng Xiaoping's uh, South China tour in 1992, where the Po River Delta flows into the Southern Sea has now been transformed into the biggest urban area and the manufacturing heartland of the world while the redistribution of capital and power continues to change the social and cultural landscape of the region. The recent top-down renaming of the former Po River Delta as the Greater Bay Area has given rise to a geopolitical, imp geopolitical implications, which asks for new strategies of relating and recuperating and of bottom-up cosmopolitanism. Before I end today's presentation, I think we can take a break from the global maps and get a closer look at the woman protagonist created by artist Cao Fei. 
With her child away at boarding school, she spends most of her time at home, tidying up the rooms, mopping the floors, cleaning the windows, and dancing to the aerobic shows in, on TV while the soup brews in the kitchen. Occasionally, she strolls around the neighborhood garden or the local mall for amusement. Her husband loves home-cooked meals and goes out nightly after watching the evening news. She often wakes up in the middle of the night and finds that her husband has not come home. This passage is from Cao Fei's short story, Building 15. The story's protagonist is a housewife resigned to her endless domestic labor, punctuated by shopping rituals and soap operas. When Cao Fei was writing this short story, she was only 25 years old and had just graduated from the Guangzhou Art Academy. Ten years later, mid-career Cao Fei um, put a similar housewife in her well-exhibited film, Haze and Fog, which was uh, produced in 2013, and prompts the spiritual malaise accompanying China's rapid urbanization in whose utopia she created stages for the workers that are bounded to the assembly lines of factory to perform their dreams as a theater of emancipation, which would define the boundaries separating dreams from reality and creatively intervene the usage of time and space. However, Cao Fei's fictional representation doesn't offer us an easy way out. Can this protagonist escape from the closed circuit of the domestic, the shops, the storages, and the factories? Can they withdraw from their roles as cyborg workers and digital housewife? In the end, we have to ask, how far can the social experiments of an, ex of an institution go? While you're watching this video of a small explosion for the demolishing of blocks of buildings across the streets of Times Museum, I want to read this paragraph from Le Guin's emblematic novel, The, one, the Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. These people go out into the street and walk down the street alone. They keep walking and walk straight out of the city of Omelas. Through the beautiful gates, they keep walking across the farmlands of Omelas. Each one goes alone, youth or girl, youth or girl, man or woman, night force. The traveler must pass down village streets between the houses with yellow lit windows and on out into the darkness of the fields. Each alone, they go west or north towards the mountains. They go on, they leave Omelas, they walk ahead into the darkness, and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist, but they seem to know where they are going, the ones who walk away from Omelas. And instead of going west and north, we go east and south, towards the oceans. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Thank you, Nikita, for this very rich and um, yeah, interesting Presentation. I think we will have many things to talk about later. Um, yeah, my name is Mani Rumigia. I'm, as already said, the head of the visual arts section at the Berliner Künstler Program, the Artists in Berlin Program. Um, yeah, and I'm here today to um, talk about what this program is and means, and also um, to maybe kind of present a bit what we are concerned with now at the moment because we, our team, our curatorial team at this program that is a multidisciplinary program is kind of in a new constellation so there's many general things we are talking about right now and also thinking about 
how this program can develop in the future. So I think I will also have a lot of questions that I will just pose uh, tonight. And I would like uh, to start, though, with a... I tried to do a very short <laughs> introduction of what the program is. I mean, I suppose uh, most of you also know um, uh, this residency program. Um, and it's also interesting to know maybe that I think three of the artists that are in this show now also are former residents of the Artists in Berlin program, Shutan, Jalal Tufik, and Alora and Kalsadia. So, um, for me, it's very important to, to talk about a, a bit about the history um, because, as our title kind of implies, we were thinking about forms of resistance. And I think that um, talking about uh, history and also rethinking history and putting it into discussion from a very also critical perspective is, can be a very interesting form of resistance as institutional agency, but also resistance for an artistic practice. So this um, residency program started a long time ago, 1963 actually, initiated by the Ford Foundation as um, formerly called Artists in Residence program. And I'm quoting now Hans-Dietrich Genscher, Minister of Foreign Affairs, 1975, um, when he said that it was formed or initiated to, to do something against the threatening cultural isolation of the city of West Berlin, introducing versatile, significant ideas and forms of cultural expression on an international level. For me, it's important to point that out and also to really start with the beginning because I think now that I'm in this position for almost six months, I have met so many people um, who I felt did not really know about the origins of this program. And it's very important to say um, that it really is and can and I think also should be kind of perceived or at least it should be kept in mind that this program is a Cold War child. It is uh, uh, something that um, kind of emerged from a political situation in a very, as we all know, um, conflictive context um, of West Berlin in the 60s. Um, from 1965, the program continued as Berliner Künstlerprogramm. Um, under the responsibility of the DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, funded by the German Foreign Ministry and also the City of Berlin, which is still the case. Um, in 75, um, after the first ten, 10 years the program was running under the umbrella of the DAD, Peter Nestler, the director of the Artists in Berlin program, stated re retrospectively that the program was meant to relieve the handicap of West Berlin's diverse political and geographical disadvantages. West Berlin's cultural performance was eventually depending from its outside world contacts. And this already, I think, is kind of an interesting tension of what you were also <laughs> talking about just now, Nikita. And, um, and yeah, so for me, it was uh, kind of important to, to lay this kind of ground for, for this presentation and also starting with this image showing uh, Andre, um, Alan Capro and Andre Neblock during the happening sweet wall at Kötener Straße in Kreuzberg. This was kind of um, an empty slot very close to the Berlin Wall at that time. Um, so, I will try, following to the images of this presentation, to map, and maybe we can also talk about this later, the program itself um, is kind of an index for the political landscape on a global level. Since it's funding maybe until today, but in its initiation, clearly, we viewed from a very Western and Eurocentric perspective especially until the end of the Cold War and the period of re geopolitical reorganization after uh, the ending of the Cold War. And, of course, that was a very important moment where um, new topics and new questions also confronted the agency of this program because if you look at the invited artists, um, let's say from 65 until end ending of the 80s or beginning of the 90s, is very clear um, which 
kind of map, I mean, I didn't bring a map, but which kind of map that would be, because it's mostly artists, or it was mostly artists from the US and, and, and Europe, and of course, like everything that would be like the so-called eastern part of the world from a European perspective, there is, of course, some exceptions, especially some positions from Japan, I think, and some from Czech Republic at a certain point. Um, it's a very, yeah, let's say, uh, reduced world, world view that was kind of represented by the program that time, clearly in line with the political context it came from. So the impact on the selection and invitation of the artists is something that is a general concern and also in our practice today. Maybe we'll find time to talk about this later. Um, I tried to give kind of an overview of what, it can only be examples of course, of uh, what kind of exhibitions and projects happened in the first years until today also. And what we can see here, if you read the caption, I know it's a bit small, um, that as the program itself didn't have a space, I mean, there was no exhibition space, everything that happened, that the artists initiated, and the program also tried to um, support and to, um, and to follow and to make possible, of course, happened in other places in the city, in other institutions. And here, for example, in Haus am Waldsee, this is like the only, the first color photograph I could find, or even photograph that was accessible to me from 69, from Piero Doracio. And I brought this because I think this is a very interesting constellation of what the perception was, and also how the program tried to deal with this idea of international, internationalization. You can read Literarische Gäste, Ausländische Schriftsteller in Berlin, so foreign uh, writers in Berlin, and then there is this 30 international artists in Berlin, um, a program from the DAD that, was, that happened in Bonn and also in Berlin in different institutions and exhibitions, and I have to, because I know the quality is quite bad, I just want to name some names. This happened in 73, and like uh, some artists of the list are Marcel Brotas, Jorge Castillo, Lourdes Castro, I think the only women in this list, um, Robert Filiou, Franz Gertsch, Richard Hamilton, Duane Hansen, Edward Keenholz, Mario Merz, Eduardo Paolozzi, and Daniel Spurry, only to name a few. And I think this is very interesting to keep in mind because if we look at, um, on how the program works today and also how the DAD gallery that exists since 78, so then there was this uh, exhibition space established in the 70s, end of the 70s, then it's quite clear that the um, collaboration or the idea of collaboration, also the idea of working in the public space is something that changed a lot through time. And, um, and especially I would say maybe in the last almost 20 years, um, kind of, hmm, kind of, got more and more hermetic in the sense of that there is a very strong or there was a very strong um, concentration of the of what what the agency would be of the program in their own spaces in their own context and I would like to get back to this a bit later um, and to think about what this means and what possibilities might be in considering again and stronger in the future to work in a more collaborative way. Yeah, I brought some images only to yeah, give some impressions. Edward Keenholz in 74 at Hochschule der Bildenden Künste, then André, um, Daniel Birin in 74 working in the public space, Mario Merz, Haus am Lützowplatz, so also spaces and, play and institutions that still exist and, and are also very active till today. Here I brought um, an image of um, Eduardo Paolozzi's mural painting at Kurfürstenstraße. He, um, I think he was in the program in 75, and then he did this painting, and after eight years, just, they just built a, like a building and covered the whole painting with that construction, and then it's really a coincidence that I was walking <laughs> around that area last year, and then I, all of a sudden, I saw this painting there again, because this very building was like torn down, and now it's covered again. So there, the, I think this is also very, like, good example to, to think about how the 
how the artists uh, in Berlin program also kind of grows and, 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 and follows the history of this place. So 78 is the moment when the first DAD gallery was established in, um, you know, maybe you know the old Einstein Cafe, and so it was there in this very same building on the first floor. So this is an installation by Pistoletto there. Then um, in 82, John Jonas was um, a resident here, and the other, it's interesting, I read yesterday, I read a quote where she said, for her, it was a very difficult time because she felt very isolated in West Berlin, being an American. And it was, a, but at the same time, she was saying that it was a very productive and fruitful time for her because she felt like not connected to any part of the world, which I found, yeah, interesting to hear. And, and maybe this is the right moment also to say that this residency program um, really tries from the beginning, I think, till today to offer the artists selected and invited um, a situation where they have most of the, let's say, practical things they need, which means a stipend rate, an apartment, travel costs, health insurance, um, German classes, <laughs> and, and there's not really a condition to this residency. So it means the artists um, can come and be here and find themselves in a very open and free space. There's no condition of production, there's no pressure to do a publication. It's really, um, it's really we are really trying to offer um, this very free um, space for work and thinking. And yeah, uh, here also you can say it, you can see the. Um, I cannot really read the caption now. Uh, let's wait. Anna Williams. Anna Williams yeah, organized this performance called the Counting Song, and if you and if you read um, the names that are, that are listed there under the number 83, then you can see that a lot of um, also fluxes. Uh, artists found themselves together in the context of this program and that had really an impact on which artists met and how they continued also working together. And um, so this was one of the things that were staged. It's also important to say, and, we, and it's still a very important uh, topic for, for the program itself, that also working not only with the resident artists, but creating situations on a long term um, to um, create a network and also to care about this network and to initiate projects also long time after uh, the artists were part of the program was something that, that was a very important, um, very important part and still is. Um, of the program itself. So this is such a case also. Then here was another uh, such, uh, of such situations where um, different artists who were part of, of the residency program um, earlier um, found together for, in, for kind of a festival for installation and performances in also different spots of the city. For example, uh, the gallery in Körner Park was a, um, a venue that was uh, used a lot um, but as I said, also a lot of other um, spaces in the city. Yeah, this image is in the, I think this is in the DID gallery. Here we have Ilya Kabakov, and I think, yeah, here with 89, it's, um, as I already said, a moment where, where the kind of landscape of the artists um, being invited and even having access to this program changed. And, um, and Ilya Kabakov was, I think, the first artist coming from Soviet Union to the program. Here we have another um, example of Karl Andres exhibition. This is also in Neukölln and Galerie im Körner Park. Okay, and then in the, city, uh, in the 90s, this was, yeah. Aisha Ackman, as far as I could find out, she was really one of the first today well-known um, female artists who was invited. So 91, Nan Gold in 92, Marina Abramovic in 90, 93, Aisha Ackman, and before that, Dorothy Janone in 76, and Bridget Riley in 71. 
Lourdes Castro, I already mentioned, 78. So this is kind of really something that was, I would say, even until the end of the 90s or beginning of 2000, something that it's really interesting to, to th see and think about. Damien Hurst, Matt Malik can hear another example also for institutional collaborations in the past. There were several artists um, who were um, part of the DID program and had exhibitions at also um, bigger institutions, especially also Neue Nationalgalerie, I think later also at Hamburger Bahnhof. Here again, in the gallery. Gabriel Orozco with a uh, project in public space, also in front of the Neue Nationalgalerie. Um, in the 90s, I felt, or I, maybe beginning um, mid of, mid, in the mid-90s, um, I felt that there was also kind of a strong um, focus uh, on artists from Latin America, especially Mexico. In the 70s, there, there was also a moment uh, where of course, due to the political situations in many uh, Latin American countries, artists from Brazil and Argentina also were coming uh, to the program. Um, that kind of, it kind of, kind of sticks out if you look at the list. Here we have, um, it's not installation, but uh, that, let's say images uh, documenting um, the process of, of, of creating a, a wall drawing by Jimmy Durham in 98 at the ID Gallery. And uh, this is a project Tacita Dean developed in 2001 while she was here. And uh, talking about Jimmy Durham and Tacita Dean also uh, gives the opportunity to think about the fact that there was a time uh, where and this, that was also especially 90s and beginning of 2000s, I think, where many artists uh, who were coming uh, to Berlin with the program also decided to stay here and are here until today, not all of them, but many. And this is a thing that really radically changed in the last years. And I think there's different reasons for that. But I think that also gives us new tasks to talk about and think about what we want and how we can keep the residency program that is so famous and so important to Berlin, as many people know and also think and address, and it's also right, but we really have now the responsibility to think about how, how, how do we continue, how do we deal with this situation that actually not, it's not anymore possible also for so many artists to stay here. And also the art system and art world changed so much, um, especially since end of the 90s and beginning of 2000s in relation to what the city is, that um, I think we have new um, strategies to think about. Dolores Cini, Juan Maidagan from Argentina, they also live here since then, still. Mona Hatoum, Mona Hatoum in 2008, she was in the program before, but she did this exhibition in 2008, I think for a while, and maybe still she was also here. Pavel Breila also had an exhibition at Neue Nationalgalerie in 2007. Then Georgia de Agbo at the Ade Gallery in 2007 too. Arthur Smijewski, Democracies. And um, I think, now I kind of missed that fact, yeah, that from 2005 on, the, the DID Gallery was not anymore at Kurfürstenstraße, but moved to a new space um, in Zimmerstraße by then. And there, um, the gallery was there until 2017, and in early 2017, the third venue of the Ade Gallery opened in Oranienstraße, where it's now, and we hope that it will stay there for a while. <laughs> so there is also kind of a flux thinking about movement in the city and also how these political changes had an impact also on kind of a mapping and um, and perceiving the city and living the city also. Ian White with his performance Democracy in 2010. Then Abraham Cruz Villegas in 2011 with a performance outside in Preussen Park. Pura Kalili. I think, yeah, I took, um, I think I integrated her also in the, um, in the presentation because this multidisciplinary program has, I mean, 
think middle on the middle of the yeah middle of the 70s um, a fourth um, discipline uh, was kind of added it started with visual arts literature and music and um, from mid 70s also film is one of the disciplines um, for residencies and uh, she came uh, with the film section or department but in the end um, had a, also an, an exhibition or installation at the gallery and uh, this is something that, that also is interesting to look at that this um, different disciplines of course is something that in the end um, becomes also so fluent one between the other and there's many examples also from the music department where artists come um, in this very context but in the end of course it's not so easy or possible and also not necessary to divide it that way but this is something that we also I think um, have constantly um, have to try to, to think about how to, how to work with it something that is now also very concerned we have thinking about the program for the next years Schindler 2014 Savannah Spong with a performance at the DBB Forum. And then this group exhibition, um, Parlamenta Pflanzen. Mm -hmm. I also integrated this in the presentation because um, it's also interesting to think about how we connect to the city and the artistic scene of the city and, and the artists who are, work here and, and also are really uh, relevant and, and, and also have an impact also on how the, um, how the artistic scene um, develops in the city. And, and this format of the group exhibitions is kind of the only way, or, 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 or not the only, but, but maybe the, the most possible way to also integrate artists that are not part of um, the residency program to the, to the exhibition program of the gallery. We're, because this gives us, or opens up a space to kind of really put artists um, into a dialogue. Artists who came here, or who were here, and maybe decided to stay here, but with artists whom they most probably anyway deal with a lot or are in touch or are even friends or I mean, and this is a, I think a, a format that is, is working really well but it's also very important to reinforce um, for the future. And this is an example because this was already also of course also done in the past but only to kind of um, mention one of the things that, that might be very relevant for what we're, we will be doing in the next years. So, so one came last year, and then um, I think I'll finish here for now with, the with this kind of historical <laughs> overview, um, with two images um, of two installations of um, the same artist, Minera Cuevas. She was here in the program in 2004 and had an exhibition at DID Gallery. And last year I re-invited her to come again 15 years later to Berlin um, for um, a couple of months. Um, and when I asked her, oh no, when I invited her, she asked me, yeah, but what do you want me to do? And I was like, no, I mean, you don't need to do anything. I mean, you can just come and see what you think you would maybe like to think about or what could maybe be of interest for future project of, projects of yours. And then shortly after she arrived, she was super sure. She was like, no, 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 I see. I mean, I saw so many changes and at the same time, so many things that did not really change, but just got worse or got kind of more intense. Like, I really, I really want to work with the city and the people living here. And I want to do something and present it again. Like, and um, yeah, I will come back to that now, but um, yeah, this, this kind of instrument, I would even say, of re-inviting artists who were here a long time ago um, and see how they also perceive the city and how they also want or could work with the city. And the city, of course, implies a lot of things um, and people and situations. I think that is something where we could also, also now connecting to this idea of storytelling as resistance or counter stories um, as a topic connecting to resistance where we could see how can these re-invitations and this kind of actualizations of, of uh, certain um, 
experiences as artists had made before here, also kind of show us or maybe offer us um, ways of, of thinking about the situation we're in, about our own very local context that can be different from what um, being inside uh, can maybe even let us think about. Yeah, um, I said in the beginning that I want to pose some questions and that's what I would like to do now, um, just to, for, to make you understand what, what we are kind of thinking about and what might have a stronger influence on what we program and do in the next time. I will just read them out and then um, we'll see if we can get back to that later. So. How can we create a sustainable space of resonance? What does the audience need and what do former residents or scholars need? How can we continue this approach of building spaces of resonances, thinking about supporting artists who go back to their countries of origin or build new fields or center of agencies somewhere else after the residency with the Artists Berlin program? How can we build up or rebuild partnerships with institutions and organizations in the city and work following a logic of collaboration and community building, finding common grounds, rather than applying strategies of territorial distinction and competition? How can we foster transparency, anti-discriminatory anti agency, and change of perspective? Who speaks and who selects in selection process and create a less hermetic situation? So um, thinking about, or maybe talking about the central focus also of, of the idea of um, counter stories or counter discourses as a method of research and as a method of agency for, as I also already said, on an institutional level, but also on an, uh, on an artistic level, I just want to um, name some, some like bullet points that are um, leading maybe also especially the, my thoughts about how to continue with the program of the gallery, but also the, the work and the interaction with the residents and guests we have. So working with the history of the program and with that kind of also summing up with how I started this presentation is a crucial thing, a very um, important um, focus point that I think kind of expands to maybe different um, levels or methods that could be uh, leading for the agency, the institutional agency of um, the Berliner Künstlerprogramm. So one of these methods or one of these also maybe tasks or duties I think we have is work on the archive of this, pro of this program because this archive kind of exists and kind of not. It's there, but it's not put in order, it's not digitized, it's not accessible, it's spread over a lot of different um, locations. <laughs> it's really hard to find material on things that happened and it's almost impossible to make this material accessible for us until now. Um, and also, as you can maybe see, <laughs> looking at my presentation, I even was kind of scanning books that were published to, to present you something today because it's not easy uh, putting this material together. And also most of the publications um, that were made, I mean, I, but I talk about historical publications on the program, um, most of the content is also only in German, which kind of is also a bit paradoxical, I think. Um, so the work on the archive and the, the idea that working on this archive can open up histories and, and make material accessible that can be a very important uh, tool for um, a critical rethinking or revisioning history and also art history because especially if you were trained in, the, in a German context as an art historian or as, a, as I did as a um, Kulturwissenschaftlerin, I don't know, no, I don't know exactly the term now how to describe that. Like, um, this DID Artists in Berlin program is a very important reference 
And it's something that is kind of an index also of how a certain canon and how a certain perspective on art history is, um, is, 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 is being set and is being told. The other thing I already, I already touched that uh, topic is um, that working with partner institutions in Berlin and also in the region of Berlin and in Germany um, is something that I think should really be um, reinforced um, to allow a wider and perspective and also an, appro an approach to an institutional practice that is much more open and can react also in a different form on um, ongoing changes, changes of the working and living conditions in the city. I mean, right now it's so... Um, really, um, it's so much discussed, the situation in Berlin, that uh, many artists have to leave their studios, don't know, don't know how, to, um, how to make up with their, kind of really on a practical level, life in the city, because many things changed. And also, we all know the art market is kind of not really strong. And the other day, I was um, sitting also on a panel talking about these issues, and I was, and I was also saying there, and I really think... And I really believe it that um, in this idea of um, working in partnerships and, and on a much more community-based level can deliver or cannot deliver, can provide um, a certain form of, um, of, a, of a productive moment where you not only feel you are uh, the victim of something, but you can also maybe move something, you can also speak out, you can also react. Yeah, the reinvitation of artists, that is something I already, I already mentioned too. Here's another example, Stephen Willets was here in the 80s and then in 2014 he was invited. And it's interesting because he did this Berlin project in the 80s and, and that was also shown at, Na Na at National Gallery. Um, and then, um, as far as I remember, that exhibition also in, at the Ade Gallery, he kind of actualized that, style, that same pro project. As he, he kind of um, looked at it through a filter, through a contemporary filter, through that very moment where he came back and found and analyzed maybe the same moments or the same... Um, 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 structures that he was investigating. So, and this is uh, the last point before I close. Um, this is another of these um, levels or methods that I think are very much connected to working with the program, uh, with the archive, sorry, and the history of the, of the Berliner Künstlerprogramm, that there are a lot of blind spots, of course. I mean, I'm really, when we think about how we communicate ourselves about the program, it's mostly always the same names that are named, like the same famous people. As I also did, I was reading out the names from this event in 73, the 30 international artists, and I mentioned the ones where I know mostly for sure that everyone here kind of knows who I'm talking about. But, of course, there were many people part of this who kind of are... Um, not really drawn attention to. And then I found this project from 82, Künstler aus Latin America, so artists from Latin America, and here we have also a map, <laughs> where I don't know why yet, because I'm in the middle of this research, but I thought it could be interesting for today to show it to you or to share it somehow, um, that th this exhibition happened. So, and th it's a list of really a lot of artists, as you can see, and here they were like divided, so Latin America was divided <laughs> between uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten countries, and then you can see from which country um, artists were invited, or maybe not even the artists, but works were shown. I don't know how this happened, and I don't know why I will find out, but I know that kind of no one knows about this. And it's not really, I mean, it's really, really difficult to find something about this exhibition project. And it really sticks out so crazy when if you look at what happened during that time and all of a sudden this exhibition appears. And um, here, this is, um, um, this is um, different um, contributions in the catalog that 
I scanned for, for to, to show them to you because um, on the left side, it's really interesting what we see there. It's an installation, an installation at the Art Gallery of the Museum in Exile. And the Museum in Exile, I don't know um, if you're familiar with it, I, I just want to say some words, is um, um, the museum uh, or, or, or a, a project that happened because the Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende in Chile was, uh, had to kind of leave, had to kind of run, let's say, after the military coup in Chile in 73. And this museum in exile was established. So the museum was traveling through different parts of the world and under other institutions were hosting the museum. And ideally, artists would donate works to the museum so the um, collection could keep on growing. Yeah. And um, this, the, in, the only institution in Germany hosting this museum in exile was the DID gallery. But no German artist donated a work, so this is another uh, research I'm involved in, and, but something that I for sure would like to talk about, and I am sure that there's much more uh, projects like this to be addressed in the future also. And with that, I hope that we find um, a way to also relate to this from today's perspective and think about how we can also resist to this history um, and this historiography uh, also we are kind of very used to um, address and used to repeat and used to um, follow. Yeah. So I, I know I'm, I'm over time, so I won't say much more, only that this exhibition, which is coming up in June, Deep Sounding History as Multiple Narratives, is also kind of a next step for us to address um, some of the things I said during this presentation. The list of artists you can see again is um, kind of a constellation of artists who were in the program or are and artists who are not. Most of them in Berlin, but not necessarily. And um, I'm curating this exhibition together with Anna Katharina Gebers. And maybe only as a side note, we planned this exhibition already for the Hamburger Bahnhof because we were working there together and then I left and then we said, okay, we see. And then we realized that on this artist list, um, many or even most of the artists were former DAD residents. <laughs> and that made us feel that it's good maybe to kind of um, keep working on it and presenting it now at DAD Gallery in summer. And I hope that we also will be able to read this as kind of a form of resistance to certain ways of historizing we are used to um, deal with. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs>
yeah, that's my, what I would like to. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I mean, first, I have never been um, to Wangso, so I don't, I don't know the place, but I'm quite sure to say that I think it's, it doesn't matter if it's there or here. I think giving an artist a free space of one year to work and live without having concerns of labor work, without having concerns of, um, I mean, at that very moment of kind of selling or not selling, or, you know, like, I think that can be anywhere. And um, I think the fact that this program was, um, was built up in West Berlin in the 60s, where, as I said, an artist like John Jonas also wrote, for example, in 82, that she felt so isolated and she felt she cannot be in touch with kind of anyone at that time, also shows that maybe it does not necessarily depend or does not necessarily need to be happening in, a, in, in, in what you just called a hub. Of course, now it's, that's also what I meant when I said it changed so much, now, now it's, it is like that, but it also has a lot of disadvantages, I think. And, and also, I mean, talking about the conditions or the non-conditions of the Artists in Berlin program, saying that there is, I mean, there is one only condition, and that would be that the artists spend most of the time in Berlin. And now you could think, yeah, it's Berlin, so of course they want to stay. But no, many of the artists, especially if they are already kind of um, more oh, like wider known, they are traveling a lot because they are kind of starting to run, you know, like to run um, after all the biennials they are invited or all the different events they feel they have to take place in or they are kind of forced to be on, <laughs> on art fairs all over the world. So I think um, actually... I would say it is totally, um, I, I would say that the local factor is not so decisive, talking about the duration or the, yeah. And, but it's also um, a lot of the artists you talked about today in the previous program of uh, the ID is also historical figures, like from, almost from my point of will, like, so, um, but um, why are the archives so inaccessible? It's actually, I'm surprised to learn that because it's such a prestige residency. That was also the first thing I learned, I think, when I came to Berlin 2009. Um, and of, in, in China is the norm because a lot of artists actually uh, work on maybe what we can call speculative archives or fictional archives because the inaccessibility of archives in any institutions and it's almost impossible to to approach those materials but yeah maybe why in Berlin um, yeah that's a good question of course um, and I cannot really answer it because when I started <laughs> when I started at, um, at the Berliner Kunstprogramm last year I was also very surprised I mean, preparing for the position and also beforehand trying to get information, I always, of course, realized, okay, like, there is not so much information accessible to people. So I was like, okay, but maybe it's just like it's an, an kind of an archive, it's there, but, but you kind of have to maybe make, yeah, you know, like, have a very um, kind of um, well-developed... Uh, research schedule or something so it isn't made accessible to you or something but no um no that's not the case and i can only say that i think that especially talking about the first four decades of this program because in the last 10 years the first um the first uh, let's say steps were made to start thinking about an archive um, but it, the first four decades especially I would say, or maybe even a bit more. Um, I think it was just not meant, uh, or let's say the focus was not so strong on um, making this, the history of this program an accessible um, good for a community, yeah? or an accessible, let's say, hmm, Mm, archive to also maybe allow a deeper research about it. 
And I don't know why. I can only say that I think that was a fact. And of course, there might have been also questions of resource, of structure, of also priorities. I mean, working in institutions always are like that. It always is like that, also from my experience. You kind of set your goals and you kind of set your focus on things. And I'm super happy that now we are a team of, of three people who really like go the same line on this, you know, we all want this to happen and it will be a very long process. I mean, we started now, like last year, um, to really write concepts and understand what it means for us, but it's really something that will take a long, long time, but it's on the agenda now. And I think that's something that, that is overdue <laughs> because there are other uh, in institutions, also comparable institutions like uh, um, Künstlerhaus Britannien, um, they, um, they started with this like years ago and, and that's a very comparable institution actually also connected to us and so I'm, what we are also doing is talking to other institutions in the city, also Berlinische Galerie for example, Britannien, um, to understand how they, how, which were the steps they, they took and how they, also, how they made it possible also on a level of resources because it is of course an issue, I mean that is really a big thing to do. Does it actually also mean a bit less like important where one artist physically located and right beside it now? Because it, it's true that also younger generation of Chinese artists now travel a lot more, and even uh, domestically people migrate. Like after 1989, of course, like Beijing was the center, and then because the southern part of China developed. I mean, markets uh, developed a bit earlier, so people came, migrated to the south to gain more uh, financial um, resources, and then after 2000 and 2008, again, a group of artists move, they live and work in Beijing, and now, again, another southern migration from Beijing to Shanghai because of the shift also of the market. And, and so now, and, and even younger generation of artists probably will not be even restricted themselves to live, uh, choose to work, or choose to be called Chinese artists anymore. They don't necessarily live uh, in China. So um, I think that that's not just that's more like kind of a global shift in terms of whether now it's important to be in one city. But I'm asking this question um, exactly because the very unique location of Times Museum, as I uh, introduced in my presentation, that we were, uh, we are on top of an 18th floor building and witness this everyday transformation of the city. You have, it's, we are reminded every day, like, okay, this really transient, constant changes, how, what can we do, or uh, what art can do uh, by confronting um, this kind of changes. Um, it's, it's not, it's, the speed is uh, quite crazy in the past 20, 30 decades. When we were talking um, before the, before we started, you also said that this question of historizing was kind of something that, that did not really happen, right? Or that was like more led by maybe an underground thing that was of course going on, but that it was kind of a big like jump, let's say, from maybe early 90s till you said, remarked the, the moment when also the first biennial started to show up, like in yeah. 2002, I think. Yeah, but uh, if we talk about historicization of art in more like a museumology mm. display, there are barely a display of art history, especially art after 1978 mm. in any museums in China because uh, the state doesn't uh, put that much, I think almost no funding yeah. in terms of acquisition of contemporary artworks and also um, because the market grew so fast and now I think it's becoming almost impossible for any state museum to acquire works that value is so 
uh, in the past 20 years. Um, so now most of the works are in private collections. Mm. And, and what about the research? I mean, are people doing research on this? I mean, or is, you know, is there kind of then ac academic or scholar um, um, driven like need um, to, to, to work on this? Um, there are probably younger generation of researchers who, um, who are interested, uh, but it's again accessibility of uh, materials. Um, I did an exhibition about Pan Yuliang, a women painter born in the early 20th century, and then in one of the state museum called Anhui Province, Provincial Museum, they have more than 3,000 pieces in the collection. But when I approached the museum, um, that we, I was rejected by the museum that I cannot have access to the archives, that there are no way I can get into the storage to actually have a look at the work. So, I think it's not just an uh, individual case. So it's really complicated. And that is, uh, that, uh, um, Pan Yuliang was, we call a modern, well, for a modernist period. And for contemporary artists, if most of the works are in, in the private collections, I don't think much resources are put on research and archives or such. So I don't know how, what might be called art history in a Western context can appear or will appear in a very different context. And so every time when people come to research on museum studies, I will, I will usually put like questions or on the table like, okay, well, there are no such uh, model of museums here and yeah. And does that connect also? I mean, because I remember when we talked about, about today, what, what, we could, what could be the topic of our conversation, you you kind of wrote me about this not idea but this maybe fact of the importance or, 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 or the significance of withdrawal also mm -hmm. as an act of or that could be read as an act of resistance, and how does that connect also to the fact that that this kind of um, questions around history and about historiography are maybe questions that. Um, are not are not so present, or are maybe very difficult to to really um, put into into discussion. Let's say. Um, I I edited a book a few years back with Biliana Sarek called Active Withdrawals, and um, and I wrote an essay there and. Actually, one thing, one case, I want to maybe tell a, a story about um, I, on, in a conference that I organized, and there was a presentation of Zheng Guogu. I think his work were also shown in detail. Um, and he constructed a crazy building in his hometown, Yangjiang, which is also a coastal city. And the, the building looked like an eccentric museum, which is actually his artist studio. And then uh, a Western art historian sitting in, in, the, yeah, in the room stood up and asked like, where's the art here? I don't see the art. So, <laughs> And, and, and of course, Zhong Guogu is kind of famous for this very um, ambitious but also ambiguous project in his hometown. He bought like huge amount of land, built gardens and dismantled it, planted trees, and then like it's, it's he called like empire. But, but then he, it's located in Yangjiang, like five hours away by car from Guangzhou, and any international curator who come visit him will have to like take this trip usually one day, which is very tough to go to Yangjiang and visit him. And even with like with such short visit, I, I don't I don't think it's possible to really connect and understand the kind of 
complex local context. The negotiation he told us about, like how he dealt with the local authorities, and also some kind of uh, uninvited uh, fines. I, I think I remember it's like some satellite scan discover he built this uh, building which was not supposed to be there and then some government official came knock at the door like oh this should not be here so they also managed to of course pay some money and all this kind of negotiation and uh, at the local level that cannot be manifested and also it's he's not taking um, what we call maybe a, a gesture or institutional critique. He's not criticizing anything. He's actually trying to withdraw what, from what we think of as uh, maybe a canon or define as uh, institutional uh, context. And, and he stay loyal to his history and, and to the city He's, he was born and has been living for. Uh, so many years. So this is the gesture of withdrawal, and I think um, there are a lot of artists in the region, uh, more or less uh, like Zhou Tao I talked about. Um, he shot this very, really uh, ambitious film in, in a form of almost like documentary film, but the way he worked, um, even for long film, he always worked like almost alone never work with a coup, um, doesn't try also trying to resist the idea of like um, this hierarchy of uh, director as the center of the, the film coup. And this is also another form of resistance and withdrawal. So there are a lot of uh, examples that I can draw on. And can you also say some words about, about the residency program you just uh, established last year, right? At Times Museum, Be two years, sorry, yeah. Because this also is something that very much is linked to, to also the history. And, and uh, when you showed the maps, I also, of course, thought about it. And I think it would be very nice to share it because, yeah. Um, yeah, because there might be also interesting kind of points of tension, maybe. Um, at we when we opened like end of 2010, we probably didn't know what we should be doing. It's very common in China. A lot of museums open or finish their buildings, open the door without knowing what to put inside the building. So just use up all the money on the building first, and then okay and we think about it. So, um, and as we have the name of museum, but actually we don't have a collection. And, um, and when, I, when I was hired or started to work in Times Museum, I stepped into the space. I think, oh, no way, this is a museum that we can, we, it's, we can only host temporary projects. It's not a museum setting. Uh, even with uh, architecture and the space, and it's impossible to control humidity, temperature, lighting. So we have to go with the flow of the space. And then, like any other museum, so uh, the first few years we center around, I would say, exhibition making or producing exhibition. And I think now it's becoming even um, more dominant format um, because of the emergence of private museums and again blockbuster shows that attract huge amount of visitors especially in uh, Shanghai so to go against again th this is a bit of withdrawal or resistance against this dominance of spectacle two years ago, um, then I kind of decided to shift our focus from exhibition making to uh, research-oriented commissions. And, and then, um, and since then, we uh, initiated the residency program, but also under the framework of um, this trajectory between Southern China and the, the south of the world because it's, it's um, part of um, what may be a different model 
compared with the developed north, um, like London or New York or Paris. This is probably most museums in Shanghai are um, projecting. Um, so, but there are a lot more resonance, I think, in terms of looking at what we call infrastructure or the lack of infrastructure in southern China or Guangzhou, the Po River Delta, and maybe even Southeast uh, Asia. And, and how artists um, self-organize and, and manage to also build a certain solidarity without support of any public funding usually, and also without the kind of bubble of the market. So, um, and, and that gives uh, us sort of autonomy or a freedom, um, rather than being in the center of competition. Again, I'm using this word, like we're trying to not think of this dualistic idea of, okay, more developed or underdeveloped. Um, that kind of drives us away from, from, from this focus, but, but I really want to ask you, when you were talking about Xiao Fei, I felt like there's like a message somehow, and, and, um, and I wanted to ask you about the role of the female artist mm -hmm. in, in also the agency of, of Times Museum, but also your curatorial work, mm. um, because well, I also tried to point out a bit how, how, how this, this aspect is, is documented within the, the, the Berliner Kunstlerprogramm, but, but yeah, I would, I would be very curious to know. Um. I, um, the, of course, there are, like, in, in terms of uh, female artists, I even, I don't have statistics, but just from impression, of course, there are still more especially what we call mid-career, or if artists that, I have to count artists that were born in the 70s, the percentage of female artists will be like really small. And those, especially those that were written somehow in history, not many. All the movements, and you can also go through the list of artists in most of the exhibition before 2000, there were barely yeah, just a few women. And then um, I, I think after the boom, uh, I mean, 2000 and 2008, and especially younger generation of artists coming out from the academy and, and have a more clear vision of, okay, they want to be professional artists. So there, there have been more female artists. But again, the barrier will be uh, mar the marriage and maybe giving birth. And some commercial galleries also tend not to work uh, much with female artists of a certain age because they're not sure whether they will be able to continue producing works after becoming a mother. But that also changed a lot because uh, Anything about China is so much about the speed, but the, the also scale of changes can, can happen in shorter time. So younger generation of artists, I would say born after 89, around 90s, even now uh, by um, just observation, usually there are equal numbers of uh, young artists in when I participate in a jury or award. And it's just more, the, the question is more like how, what can we do to support this artist to go further, to, okay, because it, you cannot always stay young. You're not always young artists. What happened after being a young artist? And to, to kind of live from young or emerging to mid-career, there need to be a lot of uh, institutional support, which is, uh, almost barely nothing at the moment, difficult for, so we, we think that's part of what Times Museum would like to put more resources in. And, and now it's becoming more possible and also um, if we work with younger generation of artists that I think we will, we absolutely put the, um, I mean, gender into consideration. But if we work with older group of artists that 
it will be really difficult to find equal number of female men, uh, male artists in one group show. Yes. So also here in this exhibition, right? Or how is the balance? Yes. I, yeah. yeah. But also here, like we invited artists from Hong Kong, and and I think the the situation and context will be a bit different. So then a question from me, maybe to break the ice. Um, because Melanie mentioned this uh, aspect of re-inviting artists um, to the DAD program in Berlin and having this long-term aspect, also artists who came to Berlin in the past and stayed in Berlin, and the question whether that is still happening or not and what to do about it. Is that something that interests you as well, Nikita, this long-term working together with artists? So for instance, if you invite artists for residencies, the aspect of exchange, that it becomes a recurring relationship. Um. For us, it's more, it's, it's long term, but not in the sense that the artist has to live or work in Guangzhou or for a year. It's more like we um, start some kind of conversation within the framework of either uh, an exhibition or a residency, and then we tend to continue this conversation and maybe lead to um, a more developed idea like what this artist might want to come back. So we want people to not come once and maybe come several times. And over the years that I think we have built such relationship and people go and come back, it's, it's actually more beautiful gesture rather than you don't have to like bind together. <laughs> Anything now from the crowd? <laughs> so then, maybe just um, a brief note uh, for the end. Now at uh, eight, uh, in a few minutes, the performance by Isaac Chung Wai will follow, part two of a performance that already happened here. And we hope that this is the beginning of many uh, conversations between Berlin and the Pearl River Delta, as productive and rich as this one. Um, and also want to very warmly invite you to our next exhibition opening, uh, Kang Chuan Raising Gravels, um, right before the gallery weekend on April 25th. So thank you very much, Nikita and Melanie, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.